Good morning. Acts 4 and verse 12 tells us, Nor is there any other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. When that statement was made, that is in reference to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We gather this morning in his name, the only name under which men may be saved. And we praise our Heavenly Father through the Son, as the song just stated, because great things he has done. If we think that Nothing else had ever been done for us but the forgiveness of our sins and a promise of heaven. It was more than we ever deserved. And God did that for us through Jesus Christ, but he's given us so much more than just that. Let us worship together in spirit and in truth. Let us praise his high and holy name. And let us remember together the price that was paid that we could be one and gathered here this morning. Our scripture reading for today is 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as always, may God bless the reading of his word. What a beautiful job. Our young men have... Uh, from the announcements to the table to our scripture reading today, have just done an outstanding job. Uh, I, I want you to reflect in your minds for just a moment on who these young men are. Now reflect on who they're going to be. These are our deacons and our elders and our preachers in future generations. And your encouragement is a large part of where these young men end up. They need that encouragement. Please take the time to encourage them as you have opportunity. I want to welcome you here today. A lot of people have welcomed you, and I want to welcome you. If you're visiting with us, thank you for making us a part of your Lord's Day. We are blessed by your presence and hope that you are blessed by being here as well as we have sung these songs and remembered the sacrifice of our Lord and given of our means and offered up petitions in prayer we're about to look into his word and look for some guidance from God, from his word, which he so readily provides to us if we will only pay attention. And sometimes that's hard to do, isn't it, as human beings, to pay attention to what it is that God wants us to do. Hopefully we're doing better than we once did, and hopefully we continue to improve as we walk through this life. A couple of things I want to point out. Jacob, you were family before you got here, brother. We love you, and we appreciate what you're doing. Uh, appreciate your family and the good job they've done in bringing you into uh, manhood and becoming the man that you are. But you were family before you got here in the abstract. Now you're family in the concrete. And so don't think you're going to get away too easily uh, from this family. We'll track you down. So uh, it's a great group of people here, and, uh, and thank you very much. And appreciate the wisdom of our elders in bringing Jacob to us to be our intern for the summer. I uh, also want to... Uh, recognize Jim and Debbie for the great job they did with Vacation Bible School. It was amazing. We had we had over a hundred people here the first night, adults and kids, and a lot of work went into it. It wasn't just Jim and Debbie, but they were kind of the the spearhead 
and uh, everybody else that was working with uh, Vacation Bible School was was following their lead and direction, and it was a an overwhelming success. So thank you you both for for what you've done, and um, I I want to. I, I want to direct your thoughts um, to to this chart over here. Uh, I gave a lesson a month, month and a half ago, and Gene came up and introduced this program. Uh, the, as you look at the card, you'll notice that sowing the seed is not just sitting down and doing a Bible study, though that would be great if everyone could do that. But sowing the seed is inviting people to church and inviting them to home studies and all of these types of things. Um, encouraging someone, taking, um, maybe you've got a neighbor who's not a Christian and you're taking them a meal. You know, we are sowing the seed because doesn't Jesus tell us that we let our light shine and so that people can see our good works and glorify God? So it's not just, even though, yes, we want to study the Bible with people. We want to help them come into a relationship with God. So there's so many different ways that we sow the seed and in sowing that seed, others come along and follow by watering that seed. God is the one who gives the increase. Never let us take credit or take the blame when there's no increase. God gets the credit for that. If there's no increase there, that's on the heart of the one on whom that seed was sown. But we, we've got to sow the seed. That's what we're called to do. And this is a reminder for us over here. Uh, of all the things, because there's so much going on behind the scenes that most people don't know about. And it's not, we're wanting to, to, uh, to blow our trumpet, so we won't be putting names up here, but just the number of contacts and things that we're doing, we want to be encouraged by that each week as we see that grow. You know, to reach 3,000 up there, we're basically doing 10 a day throughout the course of the year. And with 150 to 200 people, that ought to be pretty simple to reach. And so let's, let's sow the seed and, and let's be uh, good stewards of the blessing that we've been given from God. We, I want to mention one more thing, and there's a couple of empty seats over here, but I, I know they're not empty, but we know who's supposed to be there, and that's Norm and Helen. And Helen was supposed to go home from the hospital yesterday. Um, throughout the course of the day, they wanted to exercise a little more caution with her, and so they kept her overnight. Norm called me this morning. They're hoping she's going home today, but he called to apologize that they wouldn't be at church today. She was dead set on being here today. If they'd released her yesterday, it, it would have taken uh, a bulldozer to pull her away from here today. She wanted to be here so badly. Um, she, our, our, our sister's health is failing, and... I'll, I'll be honest with you because you deserve it. If you're going to be praying for her and she's our sister, we need to be honest. They went to put a stent in a blockage, and when they got in with the heart cath, they found multiple blockages of 95-plus percent. And at her age, uh, they were not able to do anything for those blockages because there were so many of them and that it would be more dangerous for them to try to remove those blockages than to leave those blockages. So our, our sister is, as all of us are, but even more so with her age and condition, she's on borrowed time. And she, Norm did not want to tell her until I was there the other afternoon when she had come out. And she was confused because the children were crying and she couldn't understand why. And so when I got there with tears in his eyes, he told her what the result of the test was. And he's holding onto her hand, and you know how sweet they are. I mean, they are like the sweetest couple I've ever met. They really are. If you don't know them, you're missing out on a great blessing because they are so sweet. And he's stroking her arm, and he's telling her how much he loves her, and he's breaking the news to her about this. And, and I mean, his tears are flowing down his face. And she leans over, and she looks at him, and she says, you know it's okay. It's going to be okay. And she says, I was resolved to it before. That if they could fix it, it would be okay. And if they didn't, it would be okay. And he's sitting there with tears flowing down. They're preaching a sermon to me. And he says, 
when we know Jesus has gone has prepared a place for you and he's waiting for you she said I know that's why it's okay it's so sweet they're both over 90 been married 71 years been married longer than a lot of people are going to live and and the love that they have for each other and the encouragement for for what's next They don't want to see the other one go before them, obviously. None of us do, but at the same time, they're prepared for it, and they understand it, and they know that what's next is best. Life is good, but that's best. And that's that's why, why we're living the life that we're living in the name of Jesus Christ, because we want what's best. And folks, there's a lot of people that need what they have and what we have. And so we want to share that with others. They have encouraged me so much this week. They've called for me a number of times, and I go over there, and and I'm the one that's getting the blessing. You understand? If you've ever gone and visited with someone who is in, in that condition, and you've come away with a smile on your face, and you don't understand why, then you know what I'm feeling right now, because I was trying to be a blessing to them, and they were blessing me. And I'm just very encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by the love that everyone here has, not only for them, but for all of our brethren. And God has great things in store for us here. If we will avail ourselves to him, he will work through us and accomplish great things. Make yourself available. Would you pray with me, please? Holy Father, you are truly a great and awesome God. And we come before you in the name of Jesus, acknowledging that you should receive all the honor and the glory and the praise for all that we have and all that we will be and for where our destination lies. We thank you for preparing a place for us. We thank you for making the way for us through Jesus. And we thank you for guiding us, for helping us with our understanding and for being a patient and merciful God. Father, as we look into another portion of your word, we need your help. We need that guidance. And we ask you to guide us and speak to us from your word that we can grow, that we can change, and that we can become better. Thank you for the opportunity, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to talk about knowledgeable faith. We have been spending a a good deal of time in 2 Peter, and we will be for the next quite a few weeks. Uh, We'll be taking a break the week of Faith Builders because we'll have a guest speaker. Um, Some of you uh, may not know him, uh, but he's my brother twice. He was born when I was 16 months old, and then we were reborn on the same day. And um, so he's my twice brother, and he's a gospel preacher in Florida. And he'll be up here speaking on faith builders, and he'll be speaking for us uh, in the Sunday morning service. So I hope that if you have an opportunity to come, I know he would be encouraged to meet you as uh, you will be encouraged to hear him that day. But we're going to be continuing this uh, for quite a number of weeks as we work through uh, our section of Scripture here. And I want to touch on a couple of things. I won't reread what Brian has read, but let's look at what leads us into the scripture reading which we just had. The first four verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." As his divine power has given unto us 
all things pertaining to life and godliness. If you want to know anything about life or godliness, it's right here. He gave us all things. Guess what we don't need after he gave us all things? We don't need any additions. He gave us everything that we need, and it's right here. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. When you are complete, what else do you need? Nothing. When you're complete, you're complete. This completes us. All things pertaining to life and godliness. And so we turn here for our our direction, for our instruction. We turn here for our correction. And we have uh, begun building a pyramid. And the foundation of this is that precious faith we talked about a few weeks ago. It is assumed and presumed by the author that those of like precious faith are already starting with the faith. And so he doesn't say you need to add faith to where you are. He says you add to your faith. It is assumed that's where we are. And upon that is virtue. And we talked about that last week, that moral courage to do the right thing. To do the right thing even when it's not popular to do the right thing. To say the right thing even when it may not be popular to say the right thing. Today we're going to look at knowledge, and to knowledge we will add self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness we will be adding love. And as Bryant read for us, if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither unfruitful nor short-sighted, but... An abundant entrance is going to be supplied to you. And so, we don't want to stop at faith. Faith alone is not a faith that saves. Faith alone has to have added to it that moral courage. That moral courage needs knowledge. Knowledge requires self-control. Self-control requires perseverance. Perseverance requires godliness godliness requires that brotherly kindness or brotherly love that we show each other and to that it is required that we add that agape love the love that god so loved us with that he gave his only begotten son and so let's talk about knowledge for a few moments let's talk about this knowledgeable faith now as we look at first peter um Chapter 1, 5, and 6, we add to virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control. That's where we are. This knowledge is a clear and certain perception of that which exists. It is a certainty. This is not knowledge that is uh, out there somewhere nebulous and nobody can know the truth. You know, we live in a day and time where truth is relative. And I've never quite understood that. I really haven't. You know, there are those who absolutely believe there's absolutely no absolute truth. And I wonder if they absolutely believe that. Because that would be an absolute truth. You see? There is no truth. I have my truth and you have your truth. And what's good for you might not be good for me. And and, and we go through all of these things. linguistic gymnastics and we twist and rest at words and guess what well since nobody has the truth then nobody can say anything to anybody else about what they believe I'm going to tell you something there's a truth to which we can arrive and a truth by which we must attain in order to be saved Jesus says in John 14 and verse 6 I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father but through me if there's no absolute truth then jesus is a liar he's a liar i think i'm going to side with jesus on that one how about you so we want to talk about knowledge because it is so important for us there are clear things 
And this is not so much a knowledge about Christianity and the Christian faith, but it's more uh, in regard to a discernment of God's will and God's purposes. That's what this knowledge uh, pertains to. And so discernment. Now, you know, there's a lot of educated, dumb people in the world. Am I right? My grandmother used to say they were educated beyond their intelligence. There's a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge, but they don't know what to do with it. That's the point I'm trying to make. And so if you can't discern and use that knowledge, what good is that knowledge to you? Now, there's a lot of useless information trapped inside my head. And I can remember when the, when the kids were teenagers, I was walking through, and they were watching Jeopardy, and something came up, and I just shouted out the answer and just kept on walking. They were like, how do you know that? I don't know. My parents um, did something really neat for us when we were young. They actually listened to us as to what we wanted for Christmas. And when I was in the first grade and my brother was in kindergarten, we asked Santa Claus for a set of encyclopedias. Now, who does that when they're seven and six years old? We asked for a set of encyclopedias. In three years, we had both read through the entire set. And a lot of the useless information, I'm sure, got trapped in there during that time, and I just don't know where it is, and sometimes it comes out and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but, you know, a lot of that just really doesn't matter. You know, I have a lot of information. When my first stint in college, I was a political science and history major. And one of the subject courses that I took was the, the politics of the Soviet Union. And my teacher had been studying for 10 years in Moscow. And he came back, and, and I spent all of this time studying I still have a, a textbook at home this thick about the government of the Soviet Union that no longer exists. Isn't that interesting? And so things are constantly changing, so we end up with knowledge that we can't do anything with. But see, discernment in knowledge means it is something we can use, something that helps us, that makes a difference in our lives. In Mark chapter 12, 28 through 31, Jesus is asked, and on this particular occasion, he is not asked as a trap like others do. This was a, a legitimate seeker. It says, what is the greatest command? And Jesus says, the first and great command is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus says to love God with the entirety of our being means that we love him with our mind. That word that is found there uh, for mind, translated mind, refers to a mind that has the ability to understand, to comprehend. In other words, we can't be useful idiots in the kingdom. Are you with me? We're supposed to use our brains. A lot of people have taken Christianity and turned it into something it's not. Christianity is not a feeling religion. It is a thinking religion. And our thoughts guide our feelings and not the other way around. You see? God gave us our emotions. We're supposed to have emotions. And, and I, you know, I was shedding tears up here talking about Norm and, and Helen because it's such a beautiful thing. You know, those are our emotions that God gives us. But those emotions were moved by the knowledge that I had of what I saw. Our emotions, our joy, our excitement, all of these things need to be as a result of what we know God has done for us. Because you can work a group of people into a frenzy with no knowledge whatsoever. You see it on the news every night, right? I mean, it happens. We can be just be moved into a frenzy and get everybody excited. And the next thing you know, we're throwing bricks through windows, and nobody knows why, but we're having a great time. Right? All right. We have to use our minds in Christianity. We are told to love God with a, an ability to understand in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. 
these words. Chapter 5, 15 through 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise. But what does he say? Understand what the will of the Lord is. Folks, if you couldn't understand that, there's no reason for this verse in the Bible. Do you see what I'm saying? Why would the Holy Spirit inspire Paul to write something that it was impossible for you to do? You are to understand what the Lord's will is. That doesn't mean that you understand perfectly God and everything about him because no person can. But the will of God is something that is understandable because he has revealed it to us. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And you know how he gave them to us? In language. The very thing that we use all the time. The very thing that we use in order to communicate with each other on a daily basis. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9, he writes to the church at Philippi, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment. Here, Paul brings the two ideas together. Not just in knowledge, but discernment to go along with it. The more you know, the more you need to grow in your ability to use that information. And first, where do we have to turn that, inf- that useful information? We have to turn it on ourselves. What does Jesus say about judging? He says you need to get that tree out of your eye before you worry about the speck of sawdust in somebody else's. Who do you work on first? Me. We've got to work on ourselves first. And when we work on ourselves first, guess what we're going to find out? A lot of times that things aren't as bad with that other person as we thought they were. We we couldn't see around that tree that was in our eye. You see? But if there is a problem, then we're in a better position to help them with their difficulty that they have. We see, we've got to turn these things on ourselves. Grow in knowledge and discernment. And lastly, Hebrews chapter 5, 12 through 14 shows us the danger of not doing so. There is a danger in not growing. Now, the Hebrew letter, it is believed was, we don't have an exact date, but believe is written in the mid to late 60s. So we're looking at 35 plus years after the cross. Christianity's been around a little while, right? It's been around. There are multiple generations of Christians now. This is not a first-generation group of people. And to this group of people, the Hebrew writer says, chapter 5, beginning verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of only milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. Get verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You ever heard if you don't use it, you lose it? Our brains are that way. And some people, through no fault of their own, get diseases and it impacts them, but there's other people that have a perfectly functioning brain and they won't use it. They use it just enough to get by, you know? And, and so, how are our, our senses exercised? By the use of our brain. By this time, you ought to be teachers. He's writing to Jewish Christians who some of them may have been in that very first wave of Christians that came about after the day of Pentecost. You ought to be teachers, but you need somebody to teach you again because you've fallen by the wayside. We have to exercise our senses. We've got to use our minds. God gave you a brain. How many times did your parents tell you that when you were growing up? Right? Well, they got it from somewhere. God wants you to use it. He wants you to use your feet and your hands and your eyes and, and all of you, but he wants you to not only love him with your mind, 
but he wants you to use it to his glory. Use it to his glory. This, this is an important thing for us to understand. We need to discern good from evil. We need to discern the things that are right and the things that are not. You see, here's the danger in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 1 through 7. Paul writing to the evangelist Timothy, this young preacher, and he says, but know this, that in the, in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, let's stop real quick. When are the last days? Right now. It's been the last days since then. You understand? We have three sets of, of ages or days. We've got the patriarchal, we've got the mosaic, and we've got the Christian. Guess what we're not looking for? Another age. We're in the last age. When's Jesus coming back? It could be in three seconds. It could be in three million years. We don't know. But we're not looking for another Messiah. We're not looking for another revelation. We're not looking for anything else. We're looking for the return of Christ. We're in the last days. So in the last days, that is now what's going to happen. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Wow, did Paul live in 2017? You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. It was a problem then, it's a problem now, and it's going to be a problem until the Lord returns. We need to live with it, number one. We need to recognize it's going to be going on. There's nothing we can do to make every single person on the planet think the right way. We can't do it. But number two, when we do have the opportunity to teach somebody out of one of these bad behaviors or multiple behaviors, we need to take advantage of that. Because if one less person is one of these people here, the world's already a better place. You see what I'm saying? If there's one more Christian today than there was yesterday, is the world a better place? Amen. Amen. So, down in verse, um, verse 5, what are you to do? And from such people, turn away. Don't listen to them when they're trying to force themselves upon you. For this, uh, excuse me, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loading them down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. If you don't have understanding and discernment, that knowledge doesn't do you any good at all. As a matter of fact, you can even turn that knowledge into a sin and use it wrongly. There's ignorance in spiritual matters. It was present during the time of Paul. It is present today, and it will be present till the Lord returns. We need to double down and be diligent to not be those who are ignorant in spiritual matters. Because guess what's going to happen? There's a judgment day that's coming. And is ignorance going to be a defense? Go to Matthew 25. He separates the sheep from the goats. And to the sheep, he says, enter in, you blessed of my father. For I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was in prison. I was sick. He, he says, I was all of these things. You took care of me. And you know what they did? They turned around and they said, when did we do that? He said, whenever you did these things for the least of my... See, they were doing it in ignorance, not realizing they were even doing it for the Lord himself. And they were blessed because of it. And then he turns to the goats and he says, Away with you into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and you didn't visit me, etc. And they said, Well, when did we see you and not do this? He says, Whatever you did not do to the least of these, my brethren. You, they, they were living in ignorance. 
and they're sent away into punishment for ignorance. Can you be cast out for ignorance? Well, Jesus says yes. Let's use what we know. Let, let's put into practice the things of God. Let's make certain that we are following those things. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. There's two ways in which we can grow. And I want to point these out to you and then the lesson will be yours. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Perfect there means mature. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Did you catch it? Individually, what does Peter say? You as an individual, if these things are yours and abound, an abundantly supplied entrance is going to be supplied to you. But collectively, when we put these things to use, when we discern and we understand, we are building up a functioning body as it was designed and purposed by God to be. It's not just about you. It's about the body of Christ also. We encourage each other. We build each other up. And by building each other up, what do we do? We grow the body. We help mature the body. You know, in this day and time, we live in a, in a time where most people are ignorant of biblical matters, including some that claim to follow it. We need to be that light guiding them back to the truth of God's word. But we can't teach somebody something we ourselves don't know. We can only teach what we know. We need to learn. We need to grow. And we need to have that knowledgeable faith, that discerning faith, that understanding faith. As a matter of fact, when we reach the end of Peter's epistle, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. Peter, in reference to the destruction of all the created things when Jesus comes and the fire will destroy everything. He says, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him. In peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they also do the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away from the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Folks, he says you need to avoid being led astray by error. And how do we avoid being led astray by error? We grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I can't do it for you. I can help you. You can't do it for me. You can help me. But as we help each other, we are responsible ourselves for the things that are happening within our brains and within our hearts and how we condition ourselves to follow what God has called us to follow. We're here this morning. God has called us together in community, but he's also called us together in support. And as we wind down our lessons, we 
we commonly refer to as a time of invitation and encouragement. Uh, Our brothers prepared a song for us that we're going to sing here in just a moment. Let me encourage you today to make some changes. I don't think there's anybody here that doesn't have changes to make in their life. I know I certainly do. Let us make changes. If you need help in making the changes that you need to make, let us help you. Let us pray with you and pray for you. Let us encourage you each step of the way so that you can be more the man or woman of God that he has called for you to be. If you're here today and you've never become a New Testament Christian and putting on Christ in baptism, do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? Are you willing to confess that belief, turn from the sins in your life, and be buried with him in water that is immersed for the remission of your sins that you could be raised to walk in a new life? We can help you with that today as well so that you can begin that walk of faith that leads to moral courage being added to it, and on top of that, this knowledgeable faith we've talked about today. Can we help you in any way, whatever your need is? Please make it known to us as together we stand and as we sing.